welcome to the new edition of the uh, research seminars of Mülkiye Faculty of Political Sciences. Today uh, we will host Professor Mikhail Maszetska from Slovakia. Uh, first of all, I would like to read his biography. Uh, Professor Maszetska is a sociologist by background. He focuses his interests on issues of ethnicity, race, and migration studies, as well as populism, extremism, social movements, and civil society. As an associate professor, Mihal operates at the Bratislava International School of Liberal Arts since 2015 and the Pan European University in Bratislava since 2018. Previously, he worked at the Faculty of Social Studies of Masaryk University in Brno and at the Faculty of Social and Economic Sciences of Comenius University in Bratislava. As a visiting scholar, he operated at the New School University in New York, at the University of London, at the Georgetown University in Washington, at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and he was also a ISGA PE scholar in residence at the Oxford University. From 2020, he is research fellow at ISCAP, Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy. Mihail Vasetska is a founder and former director of the Center for the Research of Ethnicity and Culture. In 1998 to 2005, he worked at the Slovak think tank Institute of Public Affairs, IBO, as a program director on expert analysis of the Slovak transformation process with a focus on national minorities and the state of civil society in Slovakia. He has been a consultant for the World Bank in 2000 to 2008 and in 2011 to 12. Since 2012, Mihail Masetska serves as a representative of the Slovak Republic in the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, Human Rights Body of the Council of Europe. He served as a vice chairman of the governmental committee VREX tackling extremism and racism in Slovakia since 2007 to 2020. In 2010 to 7, Mihail Masetska served as a chairman of the board of the Fulbright Commission in Slovakia. He is a member of the advisory board of the European Center for Minority Issues in Flensburg since 2010 and president of the executive board of the Platform for Improvement of Health Status of Disadvantaged Groups in Bratislava since 2017. Dr. Mihail Vasetska is a chairman of the editorial board of the DENIC major daily newspaper in Slovakia since 2016 and a member of the advisory board of the Prague-based Aspen Review Central Bureau in 2012-16. to Since 2016, member of the editorial board. In 2018, Mihail became a laureate of the award for special contribution in the field of human rights of Minister of Justice of Slovakia. So, uh, thank you very much for visiting our faculty. It will be very interesting to hear from you. And now, uh, I would like to give the floor to you. Thank you very much. This is a very special honor for me to stand in front of you. And, well, I, I've been introduced very properly, so I don't, don't need to add anything to it. Uh, I have been lecturing in various places, but I never had a chance to come to Turkey and to Ankara, so, so I really thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I must say that I have a tough, uh, really difficult task, because, you know, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm standing in front of people from political science, political economy, uh, you probably, and, and, you know, in front of uh, Ambassador of Slovakia, and I, I was warned that, you know, uh, of course, I should, I should be serious and political, but not political too much because it's, you know, elections are coming, so don't speak about politics. But how not to speak about politics when you are in front of political scientists and you have a political issue here, you know? So, so I will be speaking about Central Europe and Slovakia, and if you will see some similarities with Turkey, it's up to you, you know? It's, it's, it's your... It's your choice, if, if you will see it. Uh, I will be strictly speaking about my country. And, I, and let me say something positive. 
and I realize it. Uh, I'm realizing it actually in the last few years, and it gives me a lot of pride that I can speak very freely about my country. I can be very critical about my country. I can be critical about Central Europe, about the European Union, and uh, nothing really happens. You know, uh, so that gives me uh, this pleasure of being from a free country uh, and, and represent a free world. Uh, I'm sitting in front of our ambassador and, and I know that it, once I will be critical, that's fine. That uh, we, we might agree, we might disagree, but that's life in a, in a free country. So, let me, let me start with my presentation here. Okay. Uh, I, will, I will probably not mention anything you don't know, so <coughs> don't, don't expect uh, some dramatically new information. All of us, we are from social sciences and usually, you know, what can be new in 21st century? Zygmunt Bauman came with liquid modernity, uh, which was in a way banal information about liquidity of our times. Uh, before him, people like Ulrich Beck came with uh, the notion of risk society. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was new, it was moving us somewhere, but those were not really new things that would be a shifting paradigm of our understanding of the world. Um, in the last five years, as far as Slovakia is concerned, and I, I should probably mention something about the country. I have family with Slovakia. That's, by, by the way, the country which is basically the size of Ankara. Uh, which, of course, gives me a special pleasure to present, uh, present it to you. Uh, speaking about the GDP, you know, you have a very... I, I remember that there are people from economy department. So speaking about GDP per capita, uh, we are right behind Slovenia and Czech Republic out of those countries that are transforming themselves. Uh, basically, basically catching up with countries such as Spain and reaching the level of Italy soon. Uh, jumped over Greece or Portugal a long time ago. Uh, if, if you would approach it from the point of view of GDP translated into purchase power parity, it's not that fantastic. Obviously, Slovakia is becoming a very expensive country, so the purchase power is slightly dropping at the moment. Speaking about human development, I don't want to compare it to Turkey. It's a relatively high 36 uh, position in the world. Uh, speaking about uh, index of happiness, well, Slovaks are not particularly happy. They should be actually happier, bearing in mind relative uh, prosperity of the country. But something happened uh, with, with Slovakia in the last three years. And I believe that it might have been very similar to, to Turkey. So let me, let me start from a uh, pandemic world. Uh, and we are living in post-pandemic world. This is, you know, there is almost hardly anything to add to our experience that we had in the last three years. Except of one, uh, right at the beginning of pandemic, I remember how many of us from social uh, sciences, we were basically mentioning that the world changed and it will never return to the position where it was at the beginning of pandemic. Uh, we took it for granted. We uh, realized that uh, the world changed, but in fact, vast majority of people and I believe the same was in Turkey, wanted to return to, the, to life uh, before pandemic. So life as it was. Uh, and in case of Slovakia, and I believe in case of many Central European countries, this is the beginning of the problem. Uh, people, pe the world is changing very quickly. People uh, pay attention to it, but they don't want to accept the fact that the uh, world is changing and will be changing uh, actually even faster in the near future. So the, the result of it and is that we are living in a new world uh, and those of you who are working in the field of political sociology you know that you know, it depends on which angle you, you, would, you would choose, whether you would uh, speak about post-democratic character of our societies where democracy, well, everything was tested basically uh, and even in countries that uh, have democratic institutions that are free, and Slovakia belongs to one of those, 
people are deeply unsatisfied with what they have. Uh, we are living in post-civilization society. Uh, suddenly, uh, our civilizations, as we were used to them in, in the past, do, do not play such a role for us, which is, you know, and it's good and bad uh, in many aspects. We are living in uh, post-optimistic society, post-secular. Uh, some, you know, we believed and st sitting, you know, standing in front of you in Turkey, that's a good moment for it. We believe that we are living in a secular society and in practically every country of the world uh, we see that, that secular society is changing into post-secular. Suddenly we see secularization of those things that were sacral, sacralization of those things that were secular, and suddenly it's a mixture that nobody really understands. Even those who are studying it are a little bit lost in it. We are living in post-heroic society, suddenly uh, everything what, what we experienced in, in previous, uh, previous generations is not, is not uh, as it used to be. And, and of course, there are some mega trends that most of people do not pay attention to. You know, they are not paying attention to changes in the structure of society. They, they uh, have a problem to somehow swallow the, the thing that still more and more people have a problem with their mental health. Uh, by the way, I don't know about Turkey, but th this is a problem of Slovakia and many other countries in the region. Uh, still more and more people are saying that uh, mental health is a key issue in their lives. Uh, as a sociologist, I can confirm that in the uh, last uh, few months, uh, people men mentioned it as a top three problem in, in Slovakia, mental health. And it's not only pandemic. It's, it's, and it's not only war in Ukraine, it's the fact that they are not able to adjust to a new conditions in the 21st century. And, and we can go on. So we have certain mega trends, but society, so many societies are not able to adjust to it. You can see it in, in, even in countries that used to have democracy for centuries. Uh, look at the United States, how uh, many people believe that they can make America great again although hardly that they understand what, what does it mean and whether it was actually great in the past. We can, we can, have, we can have doubts even about that. Uh, and now, since we have to operationalize what we are talking about, uh, Slovakia is just part of, of much, bigger, uh, much bigger, bigger space. And let me, let me mention that, for your understanding, we are the, practically the only part of Europe uh, which used to be part of bigger structure that collapsed and then never really recovered from it. All other empires collapsed but somehow recovered. Britain, France, Russia, Ottoman Empire, and you can go on. Uh, everything is suddenly in new battles, but those, th those structures recovered. The only part that never recovered is the Central Europe. Uh, but it didn't recover even culturally or even as a civilization, I would say. You know, somewhere in the middle there is a Vienna, this beautiful capital of former, former Central European space. It's, you know, it's not important that it was a Habsburg monarchy. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's useless to say. But the problem is that what disappeared from our minds and imagination is a Central Europe as a, as a space. As a space that should cooperate, collaborate, and where, you know, as, as we some, sometimes say, uh, all train stations look very much the same, and once they were uh, named after Kaiser Franz Josef, you know. But but culturally, it's the same same space. Uh, you might remember it, uh, you know, as a part of the Soviet bloc. And my argumentation is very simple: that it's it's just that Central Europe is just one and actually tiny part of the so-called Soviet bloc. And after, especially since 80s and some of you might uh, recall it, uh, there was the movement uh, which was trying to re-establish the Central Europe as a space, or at least uh, there was a movement which was uh, fostering the whole myth of, of Central Europe. And it was coming from two sides, two levels of the debate. One was kind of a nostalgic rediscovery of interrelated but lost world of Central Europe. Uh, and, and it's very well depicted by people uh, like uh, Magris uh, from Trieste. Uh, I, I, will, I will come to that. And the second was 
debate, which was uh, concerned with negatively defining the various subjugated nations vis-a-vis -vis Soviet Union. So those of you who didn't have a chance to, to understand properly where we are coming from, I strongly rec recommend you to read Claudio Magari's Danubio, where he's describing this multi-ethnic and multicultural beauty of Central Europe. Uh, uh, basically, he's tracking the course of the Danube from its sources to the sea. Uh, and he's comparing two European rivers, Rhine, which is German and pure, and purified, uh, and sacred, and Danube, which is colorful and, uh, and full of life. Yeah, so so it's, it's, in a way, uh, it's almost a fairy tale. Uh, discussion which we probably love even more is a discussion coming from former Czechoslovakia, from our country, uh, where Milan Kundera wrote this piece, which if you didn't have a chance to read, I strongly recommend you. It's from 1984, and for the first time Milan Kundera basically said, we are the part of Western Europe which was kidnapped by somebody to the East. We were kidnapped by Soviet Union somewhere where we don't belong and where we don't want to be. Uh, what happened to us after 1945 is, is more than a tragedy. It's a civilization tragedy because we were, we were kidnapped. Uh, and yeah, so we are kidnapped West uh, and, and this is a discussion which is going on still, which has a direct impact on everything what you can, uh, what, what you see as a, as a foreign policy of various Central European nations. Uh, geopolitically, uh, of course, there are stunning differences between our countries and uh, I'm, I'm sorry to, to say that uh, especially my country is somehow, speaking about average people, lost in a ge geopolitical position. Many, many people in many other countries such as Poland or Czech Republic, they feel mostly part of, as you, as you can see, part of uh, the West. While Slovakia, many people believe in Slovakia that we are this bridge between so-called East and so-called West. Many people believe that they are part of the, part of the East. Uh, so, so Slovakia is this interesting work in progress where people still are somehow grappling, struggling with their uh, identities and it's not and it's not shaped properly. But in all countries, if you, if you take the, the, the region as a whole, there is a change in democracy score. And this is even before 2015 when the migration crisis started, which brought a lot of problems to our region. And I know that you would be laughing now because at, the, at times when we were receiving thousands of uh, refugees from Syria, you were receiving millions. And, and, and we are pretty much aware of it, and, and it's even more embarrassing, that's why. But the truth is that with my, my, the whole migration crisis and refugee crisis in 2015, a lot of, lo, lot of things changed in our region, and the, the whole region started to backslide from, from liberal democracies to various soft democracies, autocracies, plutocracies, oligarchies, and in, in various countries, it, of course, it looked differently. But all, generally, generally speaking, the changes in a democratic score, as, as you see, uh, the whole region was backsliding from previous positions. And what I'd like to mention here is uh, how, generally speaking, political science uh, and political sociology see th these changes in our region and w what we understand as, as uh, reasons for it. And and you would say, okay, we know it from Turkey, but my, my point here is that we are in 21st century and suddenly everything that was explaining uh, problems with uh, democra democracy in the past is not really something that is explaining it today. The, first, the, the very first is uh, uh, economic dimensions. I remember uh, certain problems that my country, Slovakia, had in the 90s when uh, for a certain period of time there was a rather autocratic government and when people, political scientists, economists coming from, from the so-called West were trying to explain why people are voting for uh, these autocrats, they were usually mentioning, 
Well, because people are unemployed, they, they have low wages, simply all the explanations from 20th century. Suddenly, we are realizing it's not working. You might have very easily countries such as Slovakia, in the, in the past, not at the moment, but in a in few years ago, uh, which would be growing economically, which would have very low unemployment, and still uh, open fascist political parties would enter the parliament, and that there would be a challenge for a democratic regime in times of not economic crisis, but economic prosperity. Doesn't make any sense, you know, to classical economists, that doesn't make any sense. And, and you, you see it, uh, the probability of backsliding from liberal democratic behavior is higher when economy is less open, if temporary employment rate is lower in the country, etc. These are answers from 20th century. They, they don't work anymore. Yeah. Uh, you, you might remember, since uh, I believe that uh, Turkish people and Turkish experts follow what is happening in Greece from time to time, uh, these are fascists. The first are Hungarian fascists, second Slovak and the last Greek. Uh, Hungary was stagnating when fascists came to power, okay, to, not to power, but to parliament. Slova Slovak fascists came to par uh, parliament when Slovakia actually had pretty heydays, you know, it was, it was fine. And uh, Greek, Greek fascists came to parliament uh, in a deep, uh, in a deep uh, stagnation of Greek economy. So, you see, uh, it must be something else. It, it's definitely not. It's definitely not uh, economy. Uh, what uh, what proved to be true for most of our countries is, especially urban rural cleavage, very much so. Uh, then, of course, populism, and by populism I mean the classical populism, dividing uh, country into. Uh, 10,000 uh, people living as an elite up there uh, who are deeply corrupted and millions of uh, so-called average people who are uh, struggling uh, in, in their everyday life. Secondly, populism which is characterized by the fact that uh, it has very chameleonic character, so it's changing practically every week, positions are very unclear. And thirdly, that it doesn't have any ideology, practically no ideology. Uh, and the whole Central Europe started to struggle by this type of populism, oh, in, in this sense, very classical populism, and uh, anomaly. Uh, and, and this is something what, what I have my experiences with political scientists, economists, that sometimes they don't pay enough attention to anomic performance of people. Anomie is a, is a classical collapse of normative system. Uh, in a country where basically you feel that you are surrounded by cre creatures who do not obey rules of the game, so at a certain moment you will start to do the same. Uh, this is very much explaining what is happening in countries such as Croatia, Hungary, Slovakia, to a certain extent Czech Republic. Uh, and and we, very often we don't pay enough attention to it. And what's behind it? Uh, almost unbelievable amount of uh, distrust, not, not only between people, but also to the institutions. Uh, if I would uh, compare it to Turkey, uh, Turkey, thanks to certain traditionality, as at least in rural areas, has much higher trust in between people uh, than, than, let's say, Slovakia or, or Hungary. Yeah? And, and, it's, and it's very important to, to mention it that uh, once, once you would reach such a level as in Slovakia, the secret of success of anti-democratic and anti-liberal forces are, are on the table. Uh, by the way, uh, it's not target group. You know, again, political scientists very often in the past, not now, past were explaining these backslidings by uh, basically focusing on very concrete, concrete group of people that they they are the ones who are provoking. Uh, provoking uh, the vast majority of people. In case of Central Europe, and not only Slovakia, uh, is it Roma? Well, not really. It's the definitely the most marginalized, excluded and discriminated group, most hated group, but at the same time, uh, I mean gypsies, yeah? Uh, probably you wanted to say that uh, 
just in Turkish translation. I yeah, gy gy gypsies. I, I don't. I don't know how how to say it in, in Turkish. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we we are trying to use the the, the word Roma, but I, I know that it might might be uh, unclear in some uh, moments. So so as you see, uh, of course the relations were worsening in time. This is this is coming from Slovakia to the public opinion polls from 2000-2014, but still uh, uh, radical right, radical left, uh, extremist right and extremist left can utilize it, but it's uh, the target group it, it cannot explain uh, what, what is happening. Or certain autochthonous groups, uh, let, let, me, let me give you an uh, example from Slovakia. Uh, the first one, well, this is how villages and towns in Slovakia are marked. Uh, the first is Slovak name of the city, the second, second is Hungarian. So the question to you, so what's wrong? Just try to imagine that you are Hungarian minority, so what's wrong here on the first picture? It's smaller and other it's smaller. smaller, you know, so, so you, you, might, you might have a feeling as a Hungarian minority that well, we are kind of marginalized here, you know, we are not as important as Slovak uh, uh, majority group. It changed, and this is important, uh, it changed. Uh, now Slovakia uh, has all these names of uh, uh, villages and, and, and cities equally uh, in Hungarian, Ruthenian, and in Ukrainian and in other languages. The second is, is more problematic. When Czechoslovakia was established more than 100 years ago, Names of many, especially Hungary villages, were changed completely. Uh, so th that's, and then very often they were changed after uh, Slovak uh, intellectuals from the past. You know, so try to imagine it. You know, there is a there is a Turkish, uh, for original Turkish city in Greece, and it's named after Bubulina, uh, who was fighting against Ottoman Empire. You know. Of course, it's it's kind of a symbolic violence, but the problem is that you cannot really do anything about it now. Yeah, uh, it's, it's difficult after all those hundred years, and paradoxically, even local Hungarians got used to it. And how some of Hungarian nationalists react on it? You see the the last one; those are some runes. No, nobody can read it, by the way. It, you know, it's coming somewhere from deep Central Asia and some of Hungarian nationalists are claiming that this is our original, uh, these are original letters from the deep past before we came to Europe. It's nonsense, you know, those are just some rules, but again, as a symbolic violence, it, uh, it works. Practically every single village in southern Slovakia is marked by, by these tables, and, and you know, it's saying clearly, this is our village. Yeah, so, so the fight for the place, is ownership of the place, is going on. But again, autochthonous minorities are not, not, not behind the backsliding. Jews, again, anti-Semitism in its banal form uh, is there. There are no, practically no Jews, so very often it's this kind of a conspiratory anti-Semitism which is playing other uh, functions. But Jews are definitely not triggered uh, of, of the backsliding. Uh, Migration, well, yes and no. You know, my migration definitely played an important role, but there are two uh, quotations from Slovakia. One is from Christian Democrat, the other from Social Democrat. So one from the right, the other from the left. And if you will read it, you, you will discover that both are basically saying the same. So, you know, so suddenly, so everybody's using migration in, in some way uh, and misusing very often. So, target group, in fact, it's not important. The problem is that certain social representations and certain type of causal attributions are the most important tools of some kind of extremist socialization. Uh, and target groups, so any, anybody can be used as a target group. Uh, recently in Slovakia, unfortunately, uh, it's LGBTI group. Suddenly, out of the blue, uh, they, are, they are basically serving this uh, function of so-called former Jews, uh, as, as it was 80, 100 years ago in, in the whole of Central Europe. Uh, 
the, the second part, and for me as a sociologist, this is much more appealing, I must say. Uh, backsliding from these liberal democratic regimes uh, and historical roots of civic and political culture. Because civic and political culture is something what you cannot change during one generation. And, and we are discovering it in Central Europe still more and more that it's not so much institutions, but it's what people are redistributing from one generation to another uh, in a socialization process. Yeah? And suddenly you, you, you see that there is a very strong anti-liberal sentiment in many countries, deeply state paternalistic sentiment. Uh, clientelism, clientelism not in a sense, uh, I'm not referring to economy, but clientelism in a sense that people are able to solve problems only when, when they mobilize social networks. But you know, in a way, that's, that's going against the free society, because in a free society you have to prove uh, your value by by acting as a as an agent who is who is independent who don't need any social networks you know social networks are basically coming from a, this traditional past lack of trust is as I said etc and and the very deep egalitarianism that that's that's something what uh, what, what is explaining a lot behind uh, hatred against uh, particular groups and and again, backsliding from, uh, from previous positions.